No one nation or company or even one sector can alone prevent Alzheimer's. We need as a nation to embrace a PEPFAR-like model to catalyze a broader, collaborative, accountable global response to Alzheimer's made up of governments, foundations, industry, and patients. We need agreement on global policy initiatives to stimulate the massive private investments that are going to be required to innovate and deliver safe, effective, and affordable disease-modifying treatments to families in diverse and low-resource, uh, high and low-resource settings here and worldwide. We need to invest in new digital and blood-based tools to detect and to diagnose this disease early. And we need to incent health systems here and abroad to use those tools early in the course of the disease, in the 20-year period to when the disease starts in our brains and we get symptoms. That period is both scary and at the same time an opportunity to intervene at an earlier stage of this disease and prevent symptoms uh, and later life-ravaging cognitive impairments. And we need to embrace public health interventions. Pleased to see Dr. Sherry here uh, from HHS, thanks to the leadership of Napa and HHS, uh, a strategy of lifestyle interventions, specifically to, uh, to uh, encourage healthy aging and to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's, is now a goal of the United States, as well as Europe uh, and the WHO. The U.S. government is today leading global collaborations designed to eradicate HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and polio, all diseases thought at one point in time to be uncurable. There's no uncurable disease, only those that have not been cured. It is time to execute on an accountable global goal of preventing and ultimately eradicating Alzheimer's to reduce the human suffering and financial drain on hundreds of millions of people here and around the world. I look forward to the presentations of the discussion, and I turn this over to Dr. Montgomery, my colleague in the Voices of Alzheimer's World. Thank you so much. Again, I want to say uh, thank you, actually, to uh, Committee Chairperson Don Beyer and to the committee, uh, to the congressional officers, the staff, the members, and everyone that's here today. Again, my name is Teresa. I prefer to be called Terry Montgomery, and I am living with early onset Alzheimer's. This is a face that most times when people say we have Alzheimer's, it's like, you don't look like you have Alzheimer's. But that's not the point. The point is, how is it living with it? With me living with it, the first thing that happens is health care. You're working, and suddenly you no longer have any health care. So we do have the Affordable Care Act to fall back on. But again, you get that, um, it's very pricey, but you don't get much for it. But it does give you the opportunity to uh, get treatment. That's where my journey started. I had Alzheimer's. I needed to go and just take a typical mammogram. When I went, used my card that I had, um, they told me at the hospital that I went to, we don't accept that card. You need to look on the back of the card and go where the places they tell you to go. That's not really kind. We think of those that even live in rural areas that don't even have any place to go. But I did that. I went to the hospital that I couldn't have a hospital of choice to go to. The premiums were, my husband didn't have coverage for me because uh, he had did that. It wasn't a spouse thing because we had um, blended, you know, it was, I wasn't the original. He had signed off on that. So anyway, after getting the insurance, um, I, it taken them three months, uh, after having my mammogram, I had cancer, breast cancer in my left breast, and it taken three months before I could have surgery for that. Now think about that, the people with Alzheimer's and dementia, you don't have, you can't, you don't control anything. You now have Alzheimer's, that was in 2015, and 2016 was the cancer diagnosis for the left. And then in talking to uh, receiving that news, the doctor, because I had dementia, gave me the option that you also could have a lipectomy opposed to a mastectomy. Con considering that I came from a family with a history of breast cancer, I said that I would prefer to have a mastectomy if that was possible, especially with the percentage of what was bad of the tumor, how big it was. Again, I was given... Um, 
you know, he says, okay, because of lipectomy will be easier to manage and things like that. So it's making prejudgment of people who's living with dementia to make decisions for them. So um, that was done, um, like I said, um, it was not done because it was three months. I went for a second opinion um, and then I wind up with cancer in the right breast because of the time span and all of the, the health things. Um, I went to back to my uh, home state. Originally I was in Illinois. Our family went to a different state of Georgia. Um, and um, I went because there were so many things that was happening to me. So we have a strange, I have a great husband that is patient and family um, for care that I can go back and forth and stay a while and come back to the state or whatever because things are different as to what each state offers. And that's something that I hope that we can fix because we do have some states that have nothing to offer or nothing that anyone can buy. Um, then moving along, I think that... Um, the hardest thing is living with this disease and you are hit with other chronic uh, illnesses and now you become a case management study. How worthy, but we first want to just point to the world that because we have Alzheimer's or a form of dementia, we still are worthy of good care. We're not looking for nothing for nothing. We're willing to put and pay whatever we can pay, but everyone doesn't have anything to pay. But at the same time, with the, um, we should, if you are sick, that you should be able to receive care and not um, be responsible for uh, that not happening. Um, we need for our uh, caretakers to make sure that we go and get checked for colonoscopies and all of those things. For somehow that community is forgotten. It's no reminders. Well, we're getting better at it because we're getting more focused. If we can get people to be more healthier, to have tests to screen, for we, we have that now, and that's a good thing. And I uh, commend the opportunity to be here today to help us get to where we want to go with quality care, quality recognition for those, for the, to get doctors to offer us clinical trials, to get medicine and drugs that everyone has the right to it, not based upon, especially in the African-American and the minority community and those that are rural that has no idea what to do. We just put that cry out uh, along with myself that it can happen to anyone. It's not limited to the elderly anymore. We're talking about 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds now as your norm. That's the new norm. And so I thank you for the opportunity to be here today to express that. And again, uh, keep up the good work. We're depending upon you. Jerry, thank you very much. Um, Let's move on to Dr. Paige Lynn. Dr. Lynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to participate in this very important discussion. My name is Paige Lynn, Associate Professor of Medicine at Tufts Medical Center. I'm a health economist, and my research expertise is in analyzing the cost and health impacts of Alzheimer's disease on individuals and the healthcare system. And my job in the next few minutes is to walk you through some high-level data on the cost of Alzheimer's disease based on my own research and other published studies and set the stage for discussion. So what is the economic burden of Alzheimer's disease? I'm going to show you four facts. Number one, Alzheimer's disease imposes a substantial economic burden on patients, caregivers, and the healthcare system. The total health care costs for Alzheimer's disease are estimated at $321 billion in 2022, according to the Alzheimer's Association. And that's roughly 1.2% of our GDP. And the economic burden of Alzheimer's disease is increasing over time. In terms of who pays for Alzheimer's care, here's a breakdown. As you would expect, Medicare is the largest payer covering 45% of the total care costs. And I want to call your attention to patient out-of-pocket spending, which is also substantial. 
Um, this pie chart does not include things like caregiver time costs or caregiver out-of-pocket expenses. So the total societal cost for Alzheimer's disease are even higher. Number two, hospital and nursing home costs are high in Alzheimer's disease. If we look at the cost of um, Alzheimer's by care setting, here are the annual costs for patients living at home in the mild, moderate, and severe Alzheimer's disease. The key cost driver for Alzheimer's patients living at home is hospitalizations. Hospital admissions are not only expensive, they are also stressful for patients and their family members. Another key takeaway here is these costs increase as patients progress to moderate and severe Alzheimer's. So from an economic perspective, slowing disease progression by keeping patients in the milder stages of the disease longer uh, would help reduce the care costs. And look at the cost for nursing home patients with Alzheimer's. It's a lot higher. So again, from an economic perspective, if we can keep patients living independently for a longer period of time without needing full-time care, without needing nursing home care, that will also help bring down the care cost. Number three, Alzheimer's disease complicates other health issues. You remember here while talking about a patient population who's mostly 65 and older. And as Ms. Montgomery uh, mentioned before, the majority of Alzheimer's patients have to deal with other health problems. Take diabetes, for example. Diabetes is very common in the Medicare population. And this is how much Medicare pays for someone with diabetes, but no Alzheimer's disease. And look at the Medicare expenditures for someone who has both diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. The cost is a lot higher. And this is because keeping diabetes under control requires a lot of effort in a patient's day-to-day -day life, like um, eating proper diet, checking blood sugar, uh, and taking medications. These things can be difficult for someone living with Alzheimer's disease. In my research, we found poor diabetes management and higher care costs for diabetes patients um, who also have um, Alzheimer's disease. Now moving on to a topic that's crucial but often underlooked, which is Alzheimer's care quality and cost differ by race and ethnicity. If we look at patient journey from diagnosis to end of life, my research shows that black and Hispanic versus white patients with Alzheimer's are more likely to experience diagnosis delays and treatment delays and have lower access to Alzheimer's specialty care. We also found that Black and Hispanic patients with Alzheimer's disease have lower use of hospice care, but more emergency department visits and more hospitalizations at the end of life, which lead to higher care costs. So how should we address the economic burden of Alzheimer's disease? Well, we need better treatments and more treatment options. Good news is there are a lot of promising uh, innovations in the pipeline, but we also need better care management. If we're going to reduce the economic impact of Alzheimer's disease, we must diagnose people early and make sure patients and caregivers have access to Alzheimer's care services, and we must address health disparities in Alzheimer's care. With that, thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Um, let, let's move on to Elizabeth Folland. Elizabeth, from EMD Serona. Thank you, Chairman Beyer. Um, members of the committee, staff, panelists, and to caregivers everywhere, thank you for the opportunity to let me speak with you today about the ongoing challenges facing caregivers in the United States. I'm Elizabeth Folan. I am the manager of Global Strategic Partnerships at EMD Serono, a specialty pharmaceutical company. We also operate our life science company, Millipore Sigma, and our electronics materials company, EMD Electronics, and have 14,000 employees in more than 70 facilities across 22 states. In my role, I have had the great, great, <laughs> the great pleasure and honor to be part of our Embracing Cares initiative a global initiative in collaboration with leading organizations around the world, working to raise awareness and drive action around the often overlooked needs of unpaid family caregivers. 
Embracing CARES seeks to elevate caregiving as a public health issue and respond with solutions that involve healthcare systems, governments, and communities. We work closely with our advisor partners like the Caregiver Action Network and the National Alliance for Caregiving here in the US and similar organizations worldwide. In late 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, Embracing Cares launched a global research initiative called the Care Wellbeing Index. Our goal was to better understand the nature of the day-to-day challenges that unpaid family caregivers are facing and to learn what steps need to be taken to protect caregivers' mental, emotional, physical, and financial well-being. We surveyed a total of 9,000 unpaid family caregivers from around the world, including 750 residing here in the U.S. Of those caregivers, one-third were caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. We asked them about five topics, the rising demands that they're facing, their changed responsibilities due to the pandemic, the daily toll on them and their lives, and the inequities they faced and possible solutions. The findings were even more alarming than we had expected, and we expected them to be alarming. We've known for some time that caregivers are facing immense challenges every day in trying to balance their multiple roles and responsibilities. They are not just caregivers. They are parents and grandparents, sons and daughters, employees and business leaders. They are trying to manage the day in and outs of their own lives in addition to caring for a loved one. They are struggling. In the US, employed caregivers were spending an average of 26.6 hours per week providing care, an increase of over eight hours since the beginning of the pandemic. But what gets more concerning is that 30% of them believe that they will spend on average more than 41 hours a week on care in the future. 41 hours that is in addition to any jobs that they might have, any time spent taking care of their own children, or even just the daily tasks of taking care of yourself. That is a full-time job in addition to whatever they're doing and it is too much, and it is unsustainable. We expected to hear that the pandemic had increased the financial hardships for unpaid caregivers, both in lost hours and wages, as well as what Dr. Lynn mentioned, the direct costs associated with caregiving, such as um, the spending on the care recipient. And we did find that. 54% of caregivers said that the pandemic had worsened their financial health, and more than 20% that they had reduced their working hours to care for a loved one. 18% had lost their jobs entirely. And with their caregiving responsibilities, it is not as easy for them as getting a new job or getting more hours at work. For many, these impacts will be long lasting and for some devastating. While many of these findings were unfortunately unsurprising, what did surprise us was the extent to which the mental health of caregivers is also a big risk. Two thirds of caregivers said the pandemic had worsened their emotional and mental health. They feel isolated and alone, They have no one to turn to for help, and they feel that nothing they do as a caregiver will ever be enough. They were constantly worried that the person for whom they're caring for would be exposed to COVID-19 and die. And a large part of this mental health decline is because unpaid family caregivers do not have time to care for themselves. 62% of caregivers are not getting enough sleep. 45% have postponed their own medical appointments, and 44% are exercising less than they used to. They are overwhelmed, under-resourced, and the person who feels the ramifications of this is not just the person they're caring for, but themselves. And of course, these issues are only magnified by the inequities that, in caregiving that mirror those across society. Women caregivers are more likely to be in the low-income tier, classified as a household income of below $50,000 a year, than men, 56% to 36%. Women caregivers are also more likely than men to say that they have never received support from private companies or local communities. And women caregivers are more likely than men to spend an average of 41 plus hours a week on caregiving. Additionally, women tend to have more caregiving responsibilities in general than their male counterparts, like preparing meals. And of course, these disparities go beyond gender. Caregivers in racial and ethnic minorities are more likely to have faced increased economic hardship. Of those whose financial health was worsened during the pandemic, caregivers within racial and ethnic minorities were twice as likely as white caregivers to have had their salaries reduced. It is often said that if you are not yet a caregiver, you will one day. And if you will not be a caregiver, you will likely be the one receiving care. This is an issue that impacts every state, every community, and every person in one way or another. We know that the US population is aging like many economies around the world. 
Alzheimer's disease primarily impacts those ages 65 and older. And as Americans continue to live longer, the strain on our healthcare system is going to continue to grow with the reliance on unpaid family caregivers increasing in effect. With paid professional caregivers in high demand and an ever increasing gap between those in need of care and those who are able to provide care, this work will continue to fall on unpaid family caregivers to fill the gap. Without action, this is an issue that will only get worse with time, not better. The ramifications have far-reaching impacts, not only for caregivers' well-being, but for the economy as a whole. Family caregivers are in need of our support, and they need protection. All of this emphasizes the real need for national and comprehensive paid family and medical leave, so that when the need arises, family caregivers are not facing the choice between caring for their loved ones and protecting their own livelihoods. We understand that there are ongoing discussions on both sides of the aisle about this issue, and we urge Congress to prioritize providing support for the millions of caregivers across the country. Mr. Chairman, uh, this discussion is vitally important, if only for the following reason, which is that nearly unanimously, the caregivers that we surveyed felt invisible and unsupported by the federal government. 94% said the important role caregivers play, a role that would otherwise be left to the healthcare system, governments, and charities, is not widely recognized by society and is not supported. But caregivers are the backbone of our nation. They are the owners of small businesses, corporate employees, laborers, teachers, healthcare workers, and more, and we cannot live without them. Through Embracing Cares, we are working to improve that recognition to promote public policy and private sector solutions that will ease the burden caregivers are facing, and along with our partner organizations, be a constant advocate to ensure caregivers are appropriately valued by all stakeholders, and in this, we are all the stakeholders. Thank you for your time, and I'll turn this over to Dr. Sherry. Thank you, Ms. Holmes, very much. Dr. Sherry, it's, it's fun to know you're a, uh, a DAS, the Deputy Assistant Secretary, which one of the very coolest things in federal government. So. Why, thank you. I think so, too. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Chairman Beyer. Thank you also, distinguished members and distinguished panelists. It is such an honor and privilege to be here today to talk about an incredibly important topic that HHS cares very, very deeply about. Uh, so I am a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Behavioral Health Disability and Aging Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at HHS. Um, ASPE, as we call it for short, uh, conducts policy research, advises the Secretary on policy matters, and we coordinate policy development across the department. Um, as part of this work, ASPE coordinates activities um, and implementation of the National Alzheimer's Project Act, which was signed into law in 2011, and has become the organizing framework for our federal efforts to address Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we work very closely both with our sister agencies across HHS, but also with other key federal partners, including the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Defense, and the National Science Foundation. So I'm here to share some perspectives gleaned from that work. Now, my fellow panelists have already um, highlighted so effectively and eloquently the huge economic toll that Alzheimer's disease takes on affected people and their families. And a major driver of these costs, and one of the things that's distinctive about Alzheimer's disease, is the need for round-the-clock high levels of care over multiple years. And right now, um, as Ms. Foland, as Dr. Lynn, as Ms. Montgomery, and as Mr. Radenberg have all highlighted, uh, the, uh, the lifeblood of this and really the pillar of our Alzheimer's disease care system is um, unpaid caregivers who are often family members. People enjoy being caregivers for their family members, and they find so much meaning in this work, but it can be really hard, and as the disease progresses, it places very high demands and costs on caregivers. And um, all of you have um, highlighted really um, you know, concrete examples of this. Um, these can include foregone earnings when caregiving responsibilities prevent people from being able to do other paid work, um, and also when caregivers are overburdened and inadequately supported, this can lead to adverse health outcomes for them and also for the person with Alzheimer's disease. Now, providing this level and amount of care is going to require substantial resources. So we think the question is how we can make best use of these resources and in the most person and family-centered way. Um, right now, all of this is falling on the shoulders of families. Um, so Dr. Lynn showed us that if we look just at health care costs, um, you know, Medicare is kind of is the big payer, um, and uh, while a substantial a substantial share um, uh, falls on uh, families, 
But if we actually take into account even the broader economic costs, including those associated with unpaid caregiving, about 70% of the broader economic costs fall on the shoulders of families, um, with the major drivers being the high out-of-pocket costs for long-term services and supports, um, but also the cost of unpaid caregiving. Um, so you know, economically, this is just a huge burden that our families are shouldering right now. So for this reason, HHS recognizes that support for caregivers has to be a key priority in our federal strategy to address Alzheimer's disease and its economic impacts. And this priority has been reflected in our implementation of the National Alzheimer's Project Act. And we've been addressing this through a couple of key mechanisms. So the first is through the establishment of an advisory council on Alzheimer's research, care, and services. The advisory council includes both federal but also non-federal members from a very diverse array of perspectives, including researchers, um, the philanthropic, um, and private sectors, and also importantly, we include the perspectives of people with lived experience and people who are caregivers themselves. And they advise us, they make recommendations to the secretary and to Congress on um, how we can better address Alzheimer's disease. But having this forum and these perspectives has been instrumental to helping accelerate and focus our efforts. The second mechanism, um, as Mr. Bradenberg referenced, is in our national plan to address Alzheimer's disease, which we update and publish annually and which just celebrated its 10th anniversary. The plan has six ambitious goals. Um, these include to prevent and effectively treat Alzheimer's disease by 2025, to optimize care quality and efficiency, to expand supports for people with Alzheimer's disease and their families, and to enhance public awareness and engagement. Uh, also to track progress and drive improvement. And the new goal, which we added in December of last year, is to accelerate action to promote healthy aging and reduce risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. The plan also outlines strategies to achieve these goals and specific action steps that the federal government is taking to advance these strategies. Um, and caregiving is actually embedded within each of those six goals. And I'll provide uh, just a few specific examples to highlight. It's impossible to capture the incredible breadth of work, but you know, here this just kind of gives you a flavor of what we're um, trying to support at HHS. Um, so the first is significantly increased research on caregiving. The National Institute of Aging currently supports more than 190 clinical trials as of March of this year aimed at Alzheimer's and related dementias care and caregiving. Um, and in particular, some of the things that they are investigating are interventions to teach complex skills, um, to enhance the mastery uh, and self-competency of caregivers, and also um, ways to reduce the burden and improve caregiver well-being. Um, in addition, uh, to support clinical care advances related to caregiving, uh, HRSA, our Health Resources and Services Administration, has created a 16-module Alzheimer's disease curriculum for healthcare providers that helps them to understand and address caregiver needs um, and realize that they have to be attentive to that and in addition to the person who they are treating. Um, HRSA has also developed modules to teach caregivers themselves of people living with dementia uh, and, and how to take care of their own health uh, and cope with the challenges of caregiving. And then finally, in the area of long-term services and support, since 2013, the Administration on Community Living's Alzheimer's Disease Programs Initiative, which funds grants to states uh, and communities to meet their local needs and develop dementia-capable long-term services and support systems, has trained over 53,000 caregivers, almost 100,000 medical professionals to address needs of people with Alzheimer's disease, and in doing so, has reached over 35,000 people living with dementia. And the national plan to address Alzheimer's disease is not the only action that HHS is taking to support caregivers. So the Administration for Community Living is also implementing the Recognize, Assist, Include, Support, and Engage, or the RAISE Family Caregivers Act. Um, and I do want to uh, acknowledge and thank the support of our friends in Congress um, for their support of the National Alzheimer's Project Act and this RAISE um, Family Caregiving legislation. In September of last year, the RAISE Council released its first report to Congress on federal activities to support caregivers and recommendations for priority actions to meet their needs. And um, ACL is expected to release the National Family Caregiving Strategy this fall. Like the National Plan to Address Alzheimer's Disease, we expect that this national caregiving strategy will galvanize activities by the federal government, states, local communities, and other stakeholders to better support caregivers. Now, part of supporting uh, unpaid caregivers, um, uh, to Ms. Follin's point, uh, and mitigating the economic costs associated with unpaid caregiving 
also involves expanding access to high quality um, uh, paid LTSS services, particularly in home and community-based settings where we know most people want to remain. And this provides families with Alzheimer's disease with additional choices and supports in providing care for their loved ones. And for this reason, expanding access to home and community-based services is a key priority of the Biden-Harris administration. The American Rescue Plan enabled additional investments in and an expansion of these programs through the temporary increase in federal matching for certain Medicaid-funded long-term services and supports programs. And um, this has been a really important investment um, uh, that we are you know, so pleased to have received um, and are working to use it to expand access to home and community-based services. But a barrier to further expanding access is the shortage of long-term care workers, which is projected to worsen as demand for long-term care increases with the aging of the population. So this remains a key consideration um, as we try to close those remaining gaps. Um, now, one of the roles that um, ASPE, um, uh, my office within HHS, can play to help support this work is through ensuring that we have the best data and evidence to inform and guide these policymaking. Um, and so an example of some of the work um, that we do um, is uh, using a microsimulation model that we've developed, Dynasim, that estimates future levels of disability, long-term care needs, and utilization. Um, and we use this to uh, conduct research, uh, estimating the impacts of policy changes to inform the types of investments that we might want to, make, want to make not only now, but looking ahead to the future as we prepare for the increased uh, demands and burdens on our system. So um, what's next for our federal efforts to address Alzheimer's disease? Um, well, uh, this May we recognize the 10th anniversary of our national plan, um, and we've reflected on its success in addressing Alzheimer's disease and its associated economic costs. I think the plan has accelerated federal activities, it's galvanized federal and non-federal partners, and it's significantly improved our coordination and collaboration and innovation across the federal government in taking on the significant challenge. It's also been used as a model by a number of states and countries across the world and really led to broad recognition of the unique needs of older people with cognitive impairment in all our programs. But we know there is still so much to be done to achieve the goals of the national plan uh, and HHS and our federal partners are committed to continuing and expanding that work in partnership with all of you. Um, so with that, I thank you so much. Dr. Sherry, thank you very much and thank all of you for Fascinating testimony, um, lots and lots of different ideas. We are now um, 200, 200 votes away from uh, the first thing. The, when uh, I'm, I'm gonna run at 100 and turn things over to our executive director and Mr. Radenberg to manage it, but we'll be back. Um, it, it's, it's only two votes, at least I'll be back. Uh, in the meantime, David Trone, who serves both on appropriations and on the Joint Economic Committee. David, you have some questions before you run off the vote? Yeah, just quickly, I mean, I'm no George, and I've worked on this Alzheimer's area for many, many years. Uh, my dad died of Alzheimer's, and so I had a lot of time on the caregiving side, and, you know, in person, I get that. It's a tragedy. I mean, 41 hours a week, it's, it's mind-boggling, the time they spent, as you talked about. So my only, so we got to do have to run. I'd like to pass it on to the other folks quickly, but we just want to, you know, make sure that since we're already sold on this, like oversold, and, you know, totally on drinking all the Kool-Aid that, you know, use us as a resource on appropriations next year, but not just, you know, more money, more money, but other ideas, how to make it more efficient, how to get more results, you know, how to do things a little bit better with language. So I just, you know, get us and let us be the help, be the tip of the spear on Alzheimer's because I really, you know, care deeply about this disease. Go ahead. You're up. And, and Lucia Roybal Albrot is a... Uh a veteran of the Hill and a cardinal on appropriations and um, lots of experience. Thank you. First of all, thank you to, to all of you for, for, for being here. I, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Montgomery something. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for, for being here and for the courage really to talk about your personal story. And you talked about the economic and the logistical barriers that, that you face. If there were no economic or logistical barriers. Uh, how would you like to be cared for as your uh, dementia increases, both you know, on a personal level and also in terms of your family? What, what would be the ideal uh, world for you in that case? Okay, 
um, for all of us, we're different. For me, as you're asking me, I don't want my family to put me in a home. I don't want um, to go through all steps of it. I think that that's something else that a lot of times comes up. Uh, in my case, because I have quite two diseases, but I'm hoping that um, the other one will take me out before all of it steps. But I don't want to be a burden on, um, on my family. And I think a lot of us baby boomers do not. So what can we do in that? I mean, that's something that that's a private conversation between the families and to do what that person living with the disease would want most. I think that that also would be a relief to the system when that time comes when I'm like, don't know what's going on. I don't want to live in that type of stage, nor my family to see me go through that. And, and I can just go on and go on and fill, that, fill those more funding for someone else. Can I just follow that up with uh, Dr. Lynn? Given what you're hearing, um, do we need to be maybe uh, perhaps investing in a universal national long-term care insurance program to deal with uh, diseases like we're talking about today? Yeah, I think that's definitely very important. And another thing, um, hearing what Ms. Montgomery said, I was thinking about some data we are seeing um, in the Medicare population. Um, so I wanted to mention advanced care planning. This is so important, but it's um, substantially underused in the Medicare population. And we have to recognize that people have different preferences, they have different resources, but they really need that kind of opportunity to discuss different options and have documentations for what they want um, near the end of life as their, advan uh, as their disease advances and how they want to be careful. So exactly the question you're asking, um, but advanced care planning is currently very underused. Mr. Arrington is a triple threat, Ways and Means Committee, Joint Economic Committee, and a Texan. Uh, so he was, he was, <laughs> he means that in the most pejorative sense, too. I want, I want you to know, uh, Chairman, thank you. Um, and I apologize for whisking in and out, but we'll all have to vote. Uh, this is um, a very important and serious matter. And, you know, um, observations. This is going to be exponentially more challenging as 10,000 baby boomers uh, um, not only come on to the system of Medicare, but it seems like this disease state continues to affect more and more uh, Americans and people in general as we search for the best therapeutics and a cure. So we've got to think about that in terms of the the, the first issue is how do we solve the problem and take care of those of our loved ones and fellow Americans who have this and are, are burdened with the tremendous and multitude of adverse impacts. But then you've also got the fact that it's, I read here, 210 billion out of 321 billion um, in terms of cost every year is borne by taxpayers in the federal government, and that's a trillion dollars over 10 years almost. So it is, that's just one disease state. And so how do we can keep this system of caring for seniors and all the various subsidies for safety nets at all parts sustainable? Uh, I, I, I don't have the answer to that, but I think we have to work with, with administration officials and other policy experts on that. Um, what, who, who in here can tell me where we are on market, you know, what's on the market in terms of therapeutics and most effective options available? And then I want to talk a little bit about the pricing piece of it. Let me just make a comment on that first. I, I'm not here to score points at, on, with respect to our drug price reform provisions, you know, on the Republican side versus my colleagues on the Democrat side. They, they, they want to solve the problem. Drug costs are running away from us, and we need to get control of it in some form or fashion. 
but it does, my perspective is, if we're going to find the cure and if we're going to have a pipeline of innovation that is um, putting out more efficacious treatments for people like yourself, we, we don't want to, we want to be careful not to quell innovation by putting artificial pricing on it because I've worked on commercializing drugs from a university in partnership with, with pharmaceutical companies that medium size and large alike. It is a tremendous cost and it is a tremendous risk and very few ever make it to the shelf to actually help somebody like yourself. But when you start messing around with the pricing outside of just encouraging more competition earlier in the process, which I'm for, you start to put a damper on innovation and the investment it takes to come up with that cure. So I, I, I guess first, what's out there on the market uh, for therapeutics and how close are we to a cure? And then maybe a comment, Dr. Sherry and anybody else, on how we reform the price drug price system without really doing a disservice on the innovation side to where we're, we're, we're still wandering in the wilderness trying to find a way to cure these good folks. We'll be back to you Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh boy, this no. is gonna be fun, guys. Lock the doors behind the, my colleague, please. Now we can get something done. Yeah, now we can. And I apologize. I, they're running for a reason to vote, and I'm gonna be right behind them. So can you just give me maybe just a sense for the therapeutics? And you said 80 are in clinical trial today, 80 other so thank you so much um, for the question. Um, so uh, the 190 I was referencing were actually um, trials for care and caregiving. Um, there's also a huge amount of research underway at the National Institutes of Health to try to identify promising um, therapeutic candidates. So as you all know, um, aducanumab um, was the first um, drug uh, approved in, a new drug approved in decades for Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are many other candidates that we're investigating that are in the pipeline, um, however. Um, so um, I think it remains, um, you know, an active space to watch in terms of, um, you know, which new therapeutics um, do become available. Um, I think the pricing question that you raise is, um, you know, a really important one. Um, you know, our National Institutes of Health are funding so many trials, so the good news is that there is so much active research in this space. Um, uh, and their um, investments have increased substantially um, with the, uh, since the passage of the National Alzheimer's Project Act in 2011. Um, uh, and I think with ARPA-H as well, um, we're also you know, very optimistic that this can further help to accelerate uh, our work in this space to identify therapeutics that are effective, which we agree is really critical, um, and we know such an important issue to um, patients and families. Um, I think the... Uh, Can I make one more comment? Then absolutely. I'm, I'm going to come back and listen, I promise. It, I don't want to be rude. I feel like I violate all my mama's manner, you know, <laughs> rules of manners uh, in this job. But as a former vice chancellor for research and tech transfer and commercialization, there is a big cultural drive to publish or perish. That's the, that's the MO for, for most... It's the coin of the realm for most universities. A lot, a lion's share of our R&D is going to university uh, faculty researchers, which and they're brilliant people. We need, and I would encourage you to look at the incentives for translating that research. Um, and a lot of them have this notion, uh, this sort of resistance to capitalists uh, who make tremendous investments, pharmaceutical companies specifically, and without that capital investment and risk takers, you'll never get it to the bedside. And once you publish it, you lose some value in that. Um, and there's a time and place for that. But I just think it's too skewed to let's do the research, let's find some niche, and then let's publish it. I think if you really took a look at the incentive structure for, for university researchers and encouraged them to translate that to to file patents to protect it and include some of that indirect cost and allow them to do it or even encourage them to do it. I think more of that seed corn for early stage technology could be, um, could flow 
into those spaces and into the hands of people who know how to get it to this lady. And I just think too much is lost on traditional research uh, um, uh, in, incentives in, a, in, a, in our current environment. We changed that at the university I, I, that I served at, but I, I felt like it should come from the, the, the feds ought to have a policy to, um, and this administration and Congress ought to work together on that, I think. Just my two cents. I'll be back. Thank you. We'd be delighted to work with you on that. As everyone leaves, um, I know they're rushing back. I, I am heartened by the large number of staff in the room. Um, and as a staffer, I will say I think that we all feel like we do a lot of the work. So we're here and we're listening um, and, um, and are excited to continue the conversation while they're gone. Um, while they're gone, Ms. Boland, I was um, struck by the t toll that you talked about that caregivers face and the stress that they're under. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk about resources that are available to caregivers, um, you know, and whether or not they're actually able to find them and utilize them and where there are gaps that we could start to think about how we can help um, the people who really do take on so much responsibility with this disease. Yes, absolutely. Um, this is actually one of the things that we are focusing on this year is looking at the gaps that we found from the research and looking at you know, what resources are needed. Um, one of the big areas of resources that is needed is in mental health support specifically, as this is one of the big things that helps caregivers stay in the workforce and continue to provide care. Um, because as I mentioned, it can be such an overwhelming task uh, and that is an area where it is difficult both because um, we have such need for healthcare services and mental health services in the country at large, um, but for caregivers themselves, they often face the issue that um, they don't necessarily know where to go to find resources, that they don't necessarily go looking for resources um, because they're so focused on the care that they are providing. Um, this was a, another common theme that came up in our research was this idea that um, focusing on themselves was something that they sometimes saw as selfish almost, that they thought that all of their attention should be given to the person that they're caring for. Um, there are a lot of great advocacy networks out there who are helping caregivers. The Caregiver Action Network has a 24-7, um, actually I don't think it's 24-7, but um, they have a helpline where you can call and speak to an expert and talk about the issues that you're facing. Um, they also have a bunch of resources that show you, you know, where you can go for various sort of practical supports regarding um, where you can go for health services, respite care, that sort of thing, but also the sort of um, supports such as taking care of yourself, looking after your own mental health. Um, there are a lot of resources that are needed um, financially to help caregivers. Um, as I mentioned, there's a great need for paid family and medical leave. Um, but also, like I mentioned, there's a lot of um, their personal income that goes into caregiving into, you know, particularly in the pandemic, but depending on the um, disease state, uh, PPE, there's a lot of um, cost that goes into things like transportation and meals, which often um, they're providing for the person they're caring for. Um, so I'd say those are some, you know, big areas where it's needed. And a lot of the support does come at sort of the community and advocacy level, um, which is where they're getting a lot of it. This isn't responsive to your question, but to the congressman's question, there are zero drugs on market. There is no disease-modifying drug. There are a couple of generic drugs that are treated uh, not so well, um, the symptoms of the disease. The FDA did approve a safe and effective uh, a drug uh, uh, developed by Biogen. Uh, but then Medicare basically said they didn't believe the science, they preempted the FDA's decision, and they have now put in place, with respect to the first four drugs that have come out of the coming out of the pipeline, a restriction that will probably deny access to patients for up to a decade. First, you've got to conduct a randomized clinical trial, uh, and then you have to go through a study of whether or not the benefits shown in a randomized clinical trial are replicated in the real world population reflective of the Medicare population. No one disputes the need to be, do that. But Medicare never listened to the patients who are willing to take a degree of risk working with their doctors to figure out whether that drug worked for them. 
uh, and to participate in studies, uh, but not studies that prevented them from getting access to the medicine, uh, but studies that actually allowed them access to the medicine and then to participate in the study. We patients participate in clinical trials. That's experimental product in which we were putting our lives on the line to test these drugs. And then it got to Medicare and they said, we don't trust the patient uh, perspective on whether or not uh, they are willing to take a degree of risk and a degree of judgment with their doctors as to whether or not to get drugs. So th this government, intriguingly, uh, or the Medicare, not the whole government, um, both demonstrated the value of the accelerated approval mechanism, which the FDA used, used, used it in HIV AIDS, used it in cancer, uh, and now Medicare basically saying they're nullifying that with respect to Alzheimer's drugs. It's an intolerable situation for patients, uh, and we have to turn that around. And I know that working both with Ways and Means and Energy and Commerce, there is pending or potentially pending legislation uh, that would do something about that decision, but it was a terrible decision. I would also say, uh, if we are serious, getting serious about mitigating the disparities in our population, we ought to be dealing much more effectively through our federally qualified health centers. They extend our fundamental health system out to populations uh, that are lower income and minority, um, more uh, oriented to low income and minority populations. Uh, and the federally qualified health centers, overburdened, underfinanced, could be a front line or an extension of the front line of our health system, our traditional health system. Uh, and I think, um, uh, obviously, HRSA is a major funder of that. And I think increasing HRSA's in both involvement uh, and finance to basically focus uh, on uh, treatment of Alzheimer's or risk reduction uh, for Alzheimer's uh, through time can do, if, if we are successful and hold ourselves accountable, uh, can, uh, can make a real difference for low-income and minority populations. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sherry, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the sixth goal of the national plan that I understand is um, focused on reducing risk factors. I would be delighted to. Thank you for that question. Um, so um, we do not yet have evidence of a specific intervention that will definitively prevent Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately. This is, of course, an area of tremendous interest and an area in which there's a great deal of research investment right now. However, um, what we do have is a growing evidence base to support specific types of risk factors that increase um, people's risks for developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, and also some emerging evidence that there are certain measures that can be effective in reducing the risk. So they might not prevent a person from getting Alzheimer's disease altogether, but they would make it less likely. Um, and in particular, some of the strongest evidence we have um, is behind um, uh, treating high blood pressure. Um, now, in light of that, um, in light of the tremendous um, projected growth in the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, you know, we felt it was really important to use every tool at our disposal to try to mitigate the impacts of this condition. Um, and so um, for that reason, um, our advisory council um, recommended uh, adopting a goal on risk reduction to try to take our federal efforts even further upstream and address uh, the risks of Alzheimer's disease before somebody even develops the condition. Um, and uh, this uh, recommendation was, um, re was reviewed by HHS, by our federal partners, um, and was ultimately adopted um, and, and put in our federal plan. Now, the idea behind this um, is that um, we're going to work to better identify risk factors. There is a lot of um, ad additional research underway. Um, identify effective interventions that can reduce the burden of risk factors, but also, in the, in the meantime, we want to try to get our clinical and our public health systems ready to translate those into practice. Um, uh, and so, to take an example, um, you know, high blood pressure. Um, we have emerging, you know, strong evidence that effectively treating blood pressure can reduce the risk of um, Alzheimer's disease. But we know so many people, um, you know, do not have their blood pressure effectively managed. And there are so many reasons for that. Um, and so another key focus of our plan has also been to try to, um, uh, tr try to move some of the activity for this to our public health system. 
Um, we don't think it's going to be very effective to just tell people who are coming in to see their doctor and have so many other things on their plate, uh, you got to get that blood pressure under better control. Um, we really need a health care system and a public health system that makes it easier for people to make those sorts of changes that recognizes that not everybody has the same opportunities um, and to undertake the sorts of measures um, that um, that, that might be needed to do that. And that's part of the reason why we felt like really concentrated federal investment in this space is very important. Um, so also this aligns with our overall goal of promoting healthy aging. And then, you know, another key factor that I would highlight and something that was also really, um, uh, you know, kind of critical um, in influencing um, our investments in this space is that we also view it as a really important avenue to address the you know, really profound racial and ethnic disparities that we see at every stage of the Alzheimer's disease continuum. And those start with the fact that um, the burden and prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is not equal across different populations, and in particular, um, uh, it, is, uh, it, increase, it increased in communities of color. Um, and so how do we address that? We try to go further upstream to address the risk factors that put people um, uh, that put people at elevated um, at an elevated chance of developing Alzheimer's disease in the first place. Um, so that was um, you know the kind of the reason that we really decided to make this a stated goal. Um, and with that, you know we are um, you know together with our federal partners, identifying new opportunities in which we can invest in and drive progress towards reducing the burden of risk factors. You know, we, we uh, organized uh, uh, several hundred organizations uh, in a brain health partnership that uh, helped bring uh, to Napa some attention to this, and I compliment Dr. Sherry and the HHS for embracing it. Uh, one of the um, recommendations I would make, Dr. Sherry, is that we try to get the private sector involved in this. You know, uh, private sector has an interest in the health of their workers and the workers' families, uh, paid medical leave, uh, we ought to be getting the private sector to embrace and not oppose. Uh, but there are a wide variety of things that if the government works with the private sector on a common goal and a common strategy to change behaviors, the private sector may be even more effective than the federal government coming calling and saying, we can do this for you. Uh, so I do think that we can organize on the private sector a parallel effort uh, that actually with you not only de defines the strategy, but actually gets the private sector itself to invest in the health of their workforce and in the families they serve in their communities. So I do think that uh, by, by doing that, we can make, because I think changing people's behaviors on some fundamental things and the social determinants of health is going to be a fantastically hard challenge. Uh, and we need a whole of society effort here, a national plan, not just a federal plan. And so, and, and indeed, the states ought to be deeply involved in it, too. So I do think that this is an area where the private sector, the patient advocates, uh, the, uh, the companies, the insurance companies, the hearing aid companies, uh, the wellness industry, uh, there is an enormous amount of private investment going into this space, but it's all competitive and not with a common goal that we hold ourselves as a nation accountable for so that we can assess each year whether we can reduce the risks of hypertension, of diabetes, of sleep, to, sleep apnea and sleep disorders, and a variety of other uh, risk factors. I think this is something we really ought to work together uh, in creating a national plan on this. Well, um, we, given the scale of the challenge, um, we agree an all-hands-on-deck approach um, <laughs> is, uh, is needed, and we are, we are thrilled to work with, um, with all of you. Um, and we thank you all for um, you, your support and engagement in the work so far. Um, you know, as you alluded to, Mr. Bradenburg, one of the, um, I think one of the key things that has influenced the success of um, the National Alzheimer's Project Act has been an advisory council that brings together diverse stakeholder perspectives um, and um, allows us to hear from many more voices and also is um, fully transparent. Um, our, you know, our meetings will have one next week. Um, they're uh, uh, live cast to the public. We take public comments. Um, so um, you know, it is, really is a wonderful forum for trying to um, get a, a broad array of um, parties you know, really focused on, um, on a, a key challenge. I think uh, as well we can bring uh, health systems to the party uh, because uh, 
one of the challenges you've laid out is earlier detection of risk for or early detection of the disease. Uh, and that's going to require incentives to the health system. Uh, we uh, purport to have an annual wellness visit uh, that is supposed to assess cognitive assessment. And that's been underutilized because we haven't had systematic tools uh, that are easy to use for doctors and they're they think they're undercompensated for that work. Uh, but health systems have to be brought on board and they have to actually bring brought on board in a way that the primary care workforce I'm not just talking about doctors, but nurses, nurses' assistants, physicians' assistants are brought on board to understand what the risk factors are. We've established a Brain Health Academy that you're aware of to actually work with uh, the below the doctor level of front lines of care, including pharmacies, including ophthalmologists, including audiologists. The, the front lines of work uh, of the workforce in the healthcare system that actually can deliver on identifying risk factors and implementing intervention strategies. But but most of the healthcare systems in this country are private sector, nonprofit or for profit, and so we have to bring them to the to, to, to the table. And I would emphasize again, federally qualified health centers. One comment I did want to make: um, what you said about the involvement of the private sector, because I think that oftentimes when we think about the private sector's involvement with Alzheimer's, we're thinking only of the healthcare sector. But actually, as far as you know, caregivers are concerned, I think all of the private sector can play a role in helping to support the caregiver. Um, this is something that we have seen in the responses caregivers say about how they feel treated in the workplace. And oftentimes, as a caregiver, there is you know, a fear that you will be seen as a less effective employee because you have these other responsibilities at home. We think it's really important for the private sector to step up and you know, have some work within the workplace so that employees can see that they are valued in the workplace, that caregiving is seen as a benefit to a employer, not a cost necessarily, that these caregivers are bringing a lot of valuable skills to the table, um, and that supporting a caregiver within the workplace can go a long way to keeping them in the workplace. And I did all that. Um, Exactly for caregivers, that's a really tough thing for us. But when you're, like what is being said just a few moments ago, whether it's private or public sector, that we're all on the same page. And that helps because we could cut costs as far as institutionalized or putting people at home, keep people at home with all of the technology that exists today with you know, Alexa, Google, everything talks now and can be programmed. So those are big helps. Uh, right there alone, and and again, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to bring these points up. I would say we ought not to forget the person living with the disease. I, I worked with someone on the World Dementia Council who had this disease, worked at NHS, uh, and she uh, was at the time, first time we met and uh, first meetings, she was supervising 200 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and as she, as her disease progressed, NA, NHS was very uh, made reasonable accommodations, I guess is what we would say with respect to the Americans with Disability Act, to downgrade her responsibilities with her consent uh, to the level where at the near the when she really went into some moderate deep into the moderate disease stage, she was basically handling scheduling for one person. So what they did was they made reasonable accommodations because a person who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's is not dead; mm -hmm. they're not disabled. Uh, they can, in fact, uh, they can, in fact, have a very responsible work life. So I think we ought not to forget that people living with dementia can themselves have a productive life, and that we ought to have some mechanism uh, to make reasonable accommodation uh, as their either their mental illness or their neurodegenerative disease progresses. So I, I think uh, there's a lot to be done, and a lot to be done, Dr. Sherry, with Napa. Uh, and through Napa and through your efforts, and I commend you for what you're doing and offer to help work with you on all of this. Welcome, welcome back. <laughs> uh, it, I was carrying six proxies plus me, so if I didn't vote, we'd actually lose the vote. So I have a three vote margin, so you, um, which my Republican friends were looking forward to, actually. Um, uh, do, <laughs> um, George, have, have you talked some about the 2025 vision? 
Well, we had a vision when we set this of creating a national plan, which would, in fact, um, uh, prevent and effectively treat the disease by 2025. And it's, it's clear now that we're not going to achieve that goal. And there is pending now bipartisan, bicameral legislation to extend NAPA and uh, the efforts we made with NAPA to 2035, uh, led by, uh, led by um, uh, Susan Collins. Um, we haven't held ourselves accountable, and I don't fault NAP and I don't fault HHS for this, but we don't have a system by which we measured uh, the progress we were making, uh, either on therapeutics or now we have a, another almost blank sheet challenge of how to hold ourselves accountable on the interventions that will reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. Um, and we didn't at the outset of NAPA, I was one of the founding members, really engage the nation as a whole. The federal government, and Dr. Sherry is absolutely right, NAPA has had an unquestioned ability to bring collaboration across the federal agencies, but it hasn't effectively involved the states, and it hasn't effectively involved the private sector in accountable goals that we can hold ourselves accountable to. All to the founding members of NAPA, um, uh, but we need systems of accountability to make sure we hit our goals when we set them. So I would say that Congress has been following that plan. What do you need from us uh, at NIH in order to hit the 2025 goal? And Congress has responded with rapid increases, almost unprecedented increases in Alzheimer's research spending. But the investment to innovation, the investment to impact measures have not been as great as we would have hoped 12 years ago, 12, 10 years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, and, and I think we need, since the problem is not solved, I think we still can pick up that ball, make it a national plan, not a federal plan, uh, and hold ourselves accountable. Is it possible, you know, we, we our team does a lot of work on, on fusion energy, and one of the things that the fusion folks have said is, here are the 12 or so benchmarks that have to be hit. These are engineering, you know, exactly, you, you got to figure out how to contain the plasma, you need to, one, two, three, four, five. Is that even possible with something like a disease with Alzheimer's where you can every, lay out the benchmark? Every year, NIH, uh, NIA, uh, updates its plan with what has been done and lays out uh, the process steps and the steps to be taken. What we don't have is outcome measures. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we don't know uh, with any objective assessment, where are we on that path? Uh, to getting to the 2025 goal, or may now turn into a 2035 goal. Uh, and so I think we do need those accountability measures, and those I believe those measures uh, can be done. We now have vaccines uh, in the pipeline, uh, which really offer promise in the next five to 10 years uh, to really make a dramatic dent uh, on this disease. We ought to hold ourselves accountable, as we did with COVID, on how rapidly we can develop those vaccines, what are the challenges with those vaccines, how do we adjust our regulatory system to be able to approve a vaccine on surrogate markers, and how do we actually get uh, Medicare uh, to actually pay for those vaccines when they hit the market. So I do think that uh, we can reset this uh, and, and, and get some outcome measures as opposed to process measures. How do we develop a vaccine if we don't yet know 